Time Stand Still, the timeless geometry of the megalithic arts, presented by Keith Critchlow. In this lecture, Dr. Critchlow discusses the platonic figures that were created 1,000 years before Plato and Pythagoras, with evidence of geometry being the art of the ever-true as Socrates described it. Recorded live at Megalithomania Conference 2007. Well, I, I really feel very privileged myself to be asked to come to an event like this. Um, in a way, my own adventures into megalithic world were relatively accidental. Curiously enough, um, a very remarkable photographer called Rod Bull um, had an extraordinary collection of photographs, and a publisher called me in and said, I've got this man with his wonderful... Um, pictures, would you like to come and see them? And I went to see them, and I met Rod Ball, and I, he, they said, would, would you, could you write some words to go with the pictures? So I said, okay, I've done a little bit of research in that area. And I think during the time I was writing, um, the first time I saw the, the megalithic stone balls, which are particularly Scottish, and I suddenly realized they would make a very good comparison the fact of the matter is that I think what's happening at the moment, and this kind of meeting is an indication of it, is we're having to reassess what human nature is. That sounds very strange, but it, I think it's pretty much true. We've had such a spate of materialistic science, which is not, much, not a great deal of use to us, um, meaning by that that it obviates us getting into what our own souls are about and what spirit is about and what we're doing here at all. Um, we're very good at making ourselves comfortable while we're here in this incarnate form, but what does that really do? What does it really do for the, the total purpose of the universe, maybe? Anyway, what is for sure, and many people have said it, and I'm happy to say it again and again, is that once human nature was born, it was complete. I don't believe at all in the evolution of the human species. Once human beings took on the form which was appropriate for, for them to do so, everything was there and available. And the difference between ourselves and people of the past is they put their emphasis on what really mattered, which was the, if you like, the evolution of the soul. The evolution of the body is relatively trivial in comparison. Anyway, I thought I'd like to show an image, first of all, of, from one of, one of my past students. Um, and it, to me, sums up a rather beautiful, it's a pre-dawn light that we're seeing here. And it's Swinside, the circle is called, and it shows, the picture shows the relationship between not only the stones and where they're set in on the ground, but also the whole of the visible landscape. And I think that's one of the great secrets. Megalithic human beings, or humanity at megalithic period, was incredibly sensitive to the whole. The whole was far more important to them than the part. We're obsessed by parts today, as everybody knows, and if you buy any gadgetry, if that any little part of that gadgetry goes, you're completely in the hands of the person who sold you the gadgetry. Anyway, that's something else. The other thing I wanted to um, indicate, and it was, of course, the rising or setting sun. The sun is the sole form of life, or sole source of life on our planet, uh, and also the sole source of light. And what's extremely interesting at the moment, and many of you are probably very aware of it, is that contemporary science, or empirical science, that which likes to call itself science, as if it had total right over that word, the science of the soul, of course, has been lost, but modern materialistic science have re reached a point where they cannot tell you what the ultimate particle is, because the ultimate particle has also proven to be a wave at the same time, which breaks down the whole of Aristotelian logic that modern empirical science is based on. What I'm talking about is the photon. The nearest to the ultimate particle we've got at the moment is the photon, and the photon is both. The beauty of that is it confirms Plato's, Phaedrus um, dialogue that ultimately to reach the one, to reach unity both in oneself and in one's concepts of the universe, you have to embrace paradox. You have to embrace two things being true at the same time. 
that doesn't help in domestic decision world, life and so forth, and it certainly doesn't help when you're making experiments with science or mathematics. You want something to be true or false. But when it comes to ultimate matters, that is, who am I, what am I doing here, where did I come from, what is it all about, then you do have to embrace the paradox. So, the next one in here, please. I just wanted to also begin with a, a poem. <clears throat> we all are aware now that we're sitting on a spherical planet, <clears throat> a most exquisite phenomenon, and we have no idea if there's a phenomenon anything like it in the rest of the universe, and very likely there is, but that's not the issue. The issue is that we are here now, and we are part of the Earth. Anybody to think that we're separate from the Earth, as, as the old Chinese philosopher said, universe never separates itself from humankind. Humankind separates itself from the Earth. And that's the state we're in. It's the states we've been in during my lifetime. When you've had NASA, the American NASA program, saying, oh, when we've, when we've eaten up this planet, we'll move on to another one, as if there were things you could colonize. It's terrifying. Anyway, there's a poem by Kathleen Rain on the next screen on the far side. Can I change on the far side, please? And I find this poem, Kathleen was a very good friend of mine, and she wrote this extraordinary <clears throat> poem, which I shall read out. It burns in the void, nothing upholds it, still it travels. Travelling the void, upheld by burning, nothing is still. Burning it travels, the void upholds it, still it is nothing. Nothing it travels, a burning void upheld by stillness. I find that a totally inspiring poem, and it seems to cover everything which modern empirical science could never touch. And that is the nature, to me, of inspired poetry. So. <coughs> One of the things I wanted to do was to touch on some of the natural world, which was the natural perceptual world of megalithic human humanity. And this lovely image of these wild birds' eggs in amongst the pebbles is a wonderful symbol, not only a symbol of the incredible fragility and miraculousness of life which is inside those eggshells, but also the difference between that and the hard stones, the stones which represent the most dense state of energy or matter on the planet. Of course, it, the movement from complete circularity or sphericality to the egg form is one of the deep mysteries that lies within the geometry of the megalithic circles. Next one over there, please. The other thing which would have been normal and everyday to megalithic humanity would be the discovery of fivefold symmetry in the natural world. I mean, of course, this is coming from the sea. One would talk about communities which are on the sea, sure, but the mystery of fiveness and life are very closely associated. One thing that most of us have done sometime in our life, usually in our childhood, is to actually discover our own hand and to look at our own hand and be amazed at what it is that's on the end of our arm and what it does for us and what it can do. And it is actually based on a profound fiveness. And fiveness and life are deeply intertwined. And if you want to know a little bit more about that, there's a nice little book you can buy downstairs called The Golden Mean, and that'll tell you quite a lot about fiveness and life. By dear Scott Olson, who's somewhere, I hope, in the audience. Next one here. And also, the face of a flower. The beauty of the flowery world. The flowery world came and inhabited this planet well before human being, a form suitable for humanity, arose really millions of years before we were, the flowers were. So whatever you may think about flowers, whatever, whether you think they're sentimental things, whether you think they're biological things, whether you think they're, and probably quite correctly, deeply spiritual things, they certainly are addressed to human perception, to human consciousness. A flower addresses itself to human beings more profoundly than any other aspect of the natural world. And it is the first lesson in symmetry maybe the first lesson in beautiful perfume as well, and goodness knows what. But the unfolding of a flower, the meditation of the unfolding of a flower, can tell you a vast amount, which is wordless wisdom about how life unfolds. Next one over there. 
This is after the rose has gone. What you are seeing, what is left there in this beautiful five-pointed star, was originally closed up around the petals of the rose, and one of them comes out after another, and they come out in a sequence as if you're drawing a five-pointed star. It's very, very beautiful. Again, meditation on the unfolding of roses. Many people in the room will have done, I'm sure. And when the rose petals have gone, you're left with this little emblem which tells you how it all happened, in, in, the, in a way of speaking. Next one here. And there is the spiral unfolding. All life unfolds in spirals. And um, there is the rose. I think the next slide I've got over the far side is a poem by Alain de Lille, one of the school of Chartres. And um, forgive us with the screens, but he wrote, See in the rose, see in the rose, the image of our state. Look how it shows our earthly life and fate. And that, of course, I imagine would have been the sentiments of many of the Neolithic community, the, the intimate relationship with the natural world, the dependency on the natural world, being part of the natural world, doing the thinking and feeling for the planet, which is what humanity is doing while it's here, um, rather than being something separate which exploits resources, God save us, in the way we look at, at the moment. Next one on this side. Sorry, the slide is a little bit obscure, but um, it just very simply, that image, I'll see if I can point this out, the image of the parts of the rose which are left behind, they, once you have a regular five-pointed star, the golden mean smaller to the golden mean larger is exhibited here, and the golden mean smaller to the golden mean larger is exhibited is exhibited here. So this, these two unique positions on the line um, are truly unique in as much that, um, mind you, I find myself speaking nonsense at the moment, but I'm saying two positions are unique. That's actually bad English, isn't it? But nevertheless, that particular division is in a way totally miraculous. And so before, I would recommend Scott Olson's book downstairs to really come to terms with that, because what's happening now in the same way that number seven and the quality of seven and sevenness is being rediscovered, the golden mean is now suddenly emerging. It's like it's coming back up, having sunk down in the mud for so long, and an awareness of it pervading every aspect of human knowledge is coming into being, indicating that the idea of an accidental Big Bang is pathetic. Sorry to say, it is a pathetic concept born out of a science which has lost its way. Okay, it's fine if you want to believe in a Big Bang. Um, please don't get cross with me. But I decided the whole universe was started with a big whisper. Anybody there to prove me wrong? Okay, next one over there. Now this, some people might enjoy. It's actually from the Far East, from the ancient Chinese civilization. This particular diagram illustrates the relationship between the five musical tones of Chinese classical music. There are only five. And their corresponding elements, they have five elements in the Chinese system, and the proportions of the lengths of the pipes or strings to produce the required notes or pitches. From the lowest point in clockwise or it goes gong, earth, shang, metal, yao, wood, ji, fire, yu, water. They're the five metals of the Chinese system. So the Chinese were equally involved in the whole process of what fiveness meant and what it was about and, and how it pervaded everything and still does in the Chinese civilization. Next one here. I was very delighted to find this in uh, Scott's book and that is that we all are aware that Stradivarius violins are considered to be the greatest that have ever been made and they're whatever aspiring, when a violin player gets to a certain height and success, then obviously one of the key things he wants to be able to do is to own a Stradivarius. Stradivarius violin was designed and proportioned on the golden mean, the five-pointed star. Um, it was known that he did proportion the center bits of his violin. These bits were known to be done by the golden mean, and by extrapolating, uh, probably whoever did this drawing, and forgive me, Scott, I should have asked you, whoever did this drawing realized that an extrapolation would show. But many, many medieval musical instruments were designed on this, these simple geometries. Next one on the far side, please. 
The other thing, which is quite a nice symbol, is in a Renaissance book of architecture by a student of Palladio's called Serlio, um, the muse or the, the, the young maiden, the, the um, spirit of geometry is hidden within the architecture and here as a female figure. And the seven liberal arts were always represented as young maidens uh, who carried the knowledge of arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. Here she is carrying her straight edge, her, her L-shaped tool for getting a square and a large pair of compasses for walking with. But she is, she is within the architecture, which is a perfectly good metaphor for the geometries within the standing stones that we look at. Next one here. And people forget very easily or decide to overlook the fact that so-called, and the, the, I must say I really enjoyed the, the talk we had this morning on African um, stones. The North American Indians probably reached the highest peak of how you should live in North America. And they've been the most slaughtered people, unfortunately, on the planet, history of the planet. And still... Um, there's sentiment about them. This is a North American Indian lady doing a brilliant piece of geometry which we call weaving. And she is weaving from a square beginning, which is the earth, to a circular conclusion, which is the heavens, and through a series of processes. And most, uh, well, nearly every single vessel or basket made by a North American Indian is a cosmology. Next one over there, far side there. And here is the sweat lodge. It just as a matter of interest, I don't know if I can see all that well. Could I have a show of hands of how many people in here have done a sweat in a sweat lodge? Oh, thank goodness. Oh, thank goodness. One or two. <laughs> Good. All I can say is I hope the one you did was not um, conducted by a North American Indian, because if it was, it was very painful. <laughs> anyway, the point about it is that it's an extraordinary ritual to take place in this very small space. It's also a prototype piece of architecture. Each one of those bent sticks that go over is, has a cosmological meaning. And what happens is you go into these chambers, they're covered over with, um, when in my case it was in canvas, or skins and so forth. And then one by one, 28 red hot stones are brought in and put in the center of, of the lodge. And boy, do you sweat. Well, you sweat so much you think you're not going to survive, and I'm sure quite a few people in this room have had that experience. Next one here. That was the sweat lodge that I did. The 28 stones are there still. I didn't have the strength for the next day to go back and photograph it, but it was one hell of an experience. And the man who conducted the experiment, which was in Colorado, United States, his name was Red Ute, and he was a Ute holy man. And he, like all great North American Indian holy people, they, have very, they use very few words. If they can say something to you with two words, they'll only use two words. And if they can say something with four words, which we would take a long sentence. Anyway, he was asked after the ceremony what it was all about, and he was very quiet about it, and he just came out with one thing. He said, we're related because we're created. That's an extraordinary statement. We're related because we're created. And one of the people who was sitting next to me in the sweat lodge was a Zen Buddhist monk from San Francisco, and we were walking back to the house after the, doing the sweat. And we were all pretty speechless because it was an extremely painful experience. But he said to me, um, that's extraordinarily like one of the sermons that the Lord Buddha gave. So everybody takes things in their own way. This, sorry, yes, talking about things piling up, and might say, I'm happy to say this is by one of my students in London, who's now gone back to South America, or well, she comes from originally from South America. And this is the Tetractis. Some people will be aware of the Tetractis. She's made a sort of intriguing painting out of it, because there are um, ten pieces of fruit there. But um, you see the basic core of that pattern you're looking at is seven. That is one in the middle, and six around it. And then there's a triad making up to the ten on the, the extremes, above, to right, and to the left. So there's seven and ten, making ten, and it's one at the top, plus two, plus three, plus four. And that's known as the sacred tectractus. 
and I feel sure. Well, there's a good case for actually asking the question, did Abaris, Abaris, who, was, who came down from the northern places where the stone circles were built, and joined the Pythagorean community in Greece, whether Abaris brought a lot of knowledge with him. He wasn't just came down to be a student of Pythagoras. But many people in the room will know more about Abaris than I do. But so, next one here. Here's the master himself. This is a Roman copy of, a, of an old bust, but the Roman copies were not bad. This is Pythagoras, an image of Pythagoras. And Pythagoras was an extraordinary figure. And if you want to know about Pythagoras, I would recommend you read Iamblichus, the Greek Iamblichus, um, the best life of Pythagoras. Pythagoras taught something which I believe was common wisdom to Neolithic peoples, and that is that the number, number itself, is the highest thing that human mind can contemplate. It's the nearest thing we can contemplate, nearest to the divine mind, that is pure number. And number is complete at ten. Well, it recovers unity by the time it gets to ten. There are only nine numbers, archetypically. And all of us can cope with nine numbers. What happened to a lot of us at school, we were given an overload of mathematical numbers, which are one stage down in the, in the categories of numbering, and we gave up because we found we couldn't do the mental arithmetic demanded of us. And I was one of those students too, I found it very difficult. But if you deal with numbers only up to nine, and the ten being the recovery of unity, then it's not difficult. Apart from anything else, we have eight, then we have ten, Eight and two. These are not fingers. Whenever somebody says to you, how many fingers have you got? For goodness sake, don't say ten. You've got ten extensions to your hand. But we've got twelve counting on here. This is our counter. Twelve counting here. So it makes twelve counting normal and ten counting here. Between ten and twelve, you get to the three-dimensional solution of the icosahedron. Next one over there. So Pythagoras and Plato, and Aristotle, and Euclid didn't have written numbers. It's the kind of thing we're never taught at school. We're taught how extraordinarily, how great these people are, and how they're still followed assiduously, and, and, and for good reason. But they didn't have written numbers. Number one was A, number two was B, and so forth. But what they did have, they did their numbering in pebbles. And the pebble in Greek is called a helix and was transcribed into Latin as uh, calcis, a stone, a pebble, calcis. And, and we still use the word calculation from that Latin root. If you've got a calculator that you use, you're talking about original calculation was done in pebbles. But what we see there is very interesting because we see also something which Robin Heath has done, made some remarkable strides forward, I believe, in, in the studies of metrology and, and lunar and solar rhythms. I think I'll go over and just point it out. We, we're all aware of the fact that if we take a single pebble and we surround it, we'll surround it with six others. So what we have here is we have, we have the principle of unity always in the middle, but we have the sevenness, and sevenness is always associated with a lunar number. Around that, we have the next association that we can put in is, is a group of 12. 12, which is the solar rhythm of the year. The 12 and 7 make metonic cycle, 19. But what's interesting here, a little, little game of perception for you. When you look at this, do you see that as a square, and that as a square, and that as a square, and that as a square? Or do you see this as a triangle, that as a triangle, that as a triangle, and that as a triangle? And you see how your perception has to make an interesting shift to decide whether it's looking at triangles or squares. It really doesn't matter. At the same time, what you're looking at also is the basis of repeating pattern which was taken up by the Muslim, the great Muslim artists and what we talk about as Islamic patterning, also with the same cosmological meaning. Next one here. I'm sorry I haven't got a better slide of Sesh yet, but um, I'm quite sure there are a few ladies in the audience who are perfectly aware of, of the fact that the ladies of history have never been given the amount of credit they deserve. 
which of course is a shame because one is then taking the deserving from a masculine point of view. But nevertheless, this is the wife of Thoth, and the wife of Thoth, Thoth is Seshet, and Seshet actually brought mathematics, writing, and geometry to humankind, according to the Egyptians. Thoth, okay, continued it. Thoth became Hermes and so forth, and we, and we all know that line of development through the Greek mythology and so forth. But Seshet, and there she is, actually, with a club in one hand and a stick in the other, and she's putting it into the ground from which the ropes were used to measure out the site for the temple. She taught geometry with, with stakes and flexible um, compasses, you might say. Next one over there. So, and again, I apologize for the screen, but what I wanted to point out was what my talk is going to be from now on is about five, a fiveness, a sevenness, and a nineness. These, these numbers are the ones I'm going to particularly focus on and are the subject of my book, Time Stands Still. I can't remember how many years ago I published it, but it's going to come out again next month. There's some new material in, thank goodness. <coughs> but the fiveness are the wandering planets. It is Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Those are the planets which appear to go backwards in the sky. But I feel totally convinced myself, because there's very early Chinese records of it. <coughs> when you record these so-called retrograde loops, from the center of the Earth, which is the only place we can record anything from, if we're being honest. We can't place ourselves on the sun, although modern teaching of children is to say, you be on the sun and we're all going around it. Very dangerous, I believe. Nevertheless, if you place the Earth in the middle and you chart where in the heavens these loops happen, you've got perfect fivefold symmetry <coughs> from, for instance, the planet Venus. You've got a perfect threefold symmetry from the planet Mercury. You get a 11-fold symmetry, 29-fold symmetry from here, the 8-fold symmetry from this planet. Those are the retrograde moons, symmetrical retrograde moons around us on Earth. Therefore, each of the gods or planets, whatever you want to call them, are actually bringing those numerical methods, messages, numerical and geometric messages. So when it comes to up to 7, the Earth would be in the middle here. Nearest to us is the Moon, next nearest is Mercury, next nearest is Venus, next the Sun, next Mars, next Jupiter, next Saturn, and the nearest places. I have published um, very short, and in a way apologetically short, I think Amanda's got them in the stall down, so a little paper to everybody who wants them, and the qualities of sevenness is on the inside of this paper here, and it does deserve quite a lot of study. Okay, next one here. So, starting with the fiveness, we go to um, a stone circle called Molti Ucha. Oh, wonderful, I'm doing well for water here. And the stone, what is remarkable for those people, the real hero of maybe megalithomania, I don't know, the real hero has to be Alexander Tom, Professor Alexander Tom. He was a surveyor, and like myself, he wasn't an archaeologist any more than I am. I you know, rather consider myself more an architectural designer, possibly, or a designer. And he was a, a surveyor, and he has surveyed the stones so precisely with such care that something which could look to the superficial eye more or less circular, when he surveyed every stone, and he took the center of gravity of each stone, he then asked his computer to give him the line of the, the most convenient line between those centers of gravity, he suddenly discovered the most extraordinary thing. In this particular case, this is one of the most sophisticated stone circles in Britain. It's actually in Wales. Anybody wants to visit Mole, it's a wonderful pilgrimage, quite high up, and there's nothing anywhere near it. So, there are five points here which actually decide where the curves are struck in, in the making of this, this circle. And that's what um, Alexander Tom discovered, and we'll go into that a bit more on there. We'll come back to the mole. This is another of the solutions that Alexander Tom came to by surveying, and this is, um, was the solution to a particular stone circle up in the north of England called Borrowstone Rig, and that has an extraordinary, um, extraordinary quality of actually having, th as this is a fiveness, Borrowstone Rig is a sevenness. And Alexander Tom was very fascinated about the, the triangle, which 
the original Pythagorean triangle, which all these things tend to grow from, um, was inaccurate by a very, very small amount. And he said, almost imperceptible. But that small amount was how it shifted from something which is, is an extraordinary mystery. You can't make a seven-pointed star or a seven-sided figure with a compass and a straight edge. It's one of the reasons why it's the virgin number. It's, it's, it, it actually avoids being made. Next one here. Now here. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is another of the types of, 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 of geometries that we use. Again, a Pythagorean triangle in here, and then extensions from it to this point would encompass, this point here would encompass, this point would encompass, and then the center between the two would create the rest of it. And the fascinating thing about it is that the you, the, the perimeter of these egg shapes are rational, whereas the perimeter of a circle is not rational, it's transrational. It's not possible to resolve the perimeter of a circle if, you, if you've got a whole number as your radius. But everybody knows that pi. It just goes on forever, and I think you could wear out all the computers on the planet trying to get it to resolve. So the megalithic people are also creating heaven, the circular form is heaven, creating an understandable heaven on earth, which is basically square. Or if you like, and they still use the Pythagorean triangle to establish a right angle when they're putting a building together, even now in the UK. So they are about establishing heaven on earth. And I'll hope to get into that a little bit more as we go. Next one over there. There is the sevenness of Borrowstone Rig. Can we go back again one shot? This circle, straight and circle, okay, keep that in mind. Next one. And this is where the stones are, and it shows how profoundly valuable Alexander Tom's surveys were, were to actually arrive at this. Now, I've constructed in here the, the Vedic or the Hindu method of, of, of getting what I believe they could have used, but what it amounts to is the circle at the top there there are two sevenths of, of completing the circle, which comes to here. And by taking the big circle at the bottom and completing that, we get a large seven and a small seven. So sevenness is fundamental to Borrowstone Rig. That's what I've shown in my, my books, Time Stand Still. Next one. The, the, sorry, no, that one's... Yes, there we go. That is the... Um, in the book, I argue how the Vedic method of using a shadow stick from the sun to get orientation and so forth. Next one over there. Now, what's interesting is that, that there are, they're much later, of course, because they're an age when, when the community in Britain were using metal. And there happened to be only three um, metal plates, two of which were found on burials, on the breastplate, on the breast of the person who was buried who presumably was a person of great importance. But the three breastplates that we have, the three gold plates that we have in existence, um, I think two of them in the British Museum and one is in a local museum in, in Dorset, um, they are all related to this extraordinary, almost obsession Neolithic man had for um, seven and nine. That shape, I think the next one in here will show it, is, is, is a template to make two sevenths. If you, if you have a circle and you can't make this circle into seven intervals with a straight edge and a compass, <coughs> and once you have achieved it, if you make yourself a, a template, and the word template is quite an important one in itself, that template can then establish a sevenness on a circle immediately. Because that axis through there, will, and the two points will give you first two sevenths. So these gold plates can be, can be used, and I've no doubt myself they were used for establishing these key geometric symmetries. We have eventually to get onto what that all meant, but hopefully I'll do that. Next one over there. This is a these are people who are still alive, and that's the way they tell the time of the year. They're not interested in telling the time of the day, because that is built into their own biological rhythms, but the time of the year are being measured by 
these two Borneo Indians, as we call them. I, sad to call them that because no doubt they call themselves by a far more dignified name. And what they're doing is they're measuring the length of the shadow from the longest shadow in winter to the shortest shadow in summer, according to where the sun is passing over. And they are there putting their sticks in and measuring. There's a little, this little god figure carved on the top of the post there, but that same post is the, the post, I believe, that Seshet was knocking in with her mallet in the previous illustration I showed. Next one here. There are the stones of Alan Water. And it's rather a shame that the stone, this particular stone egg form is called Alan Water because Alan Water is quite a long way away from where it is to be found. It's, a, it's another perfect example of the, of the profound importance of Alexander Tom. He took these dark stones, the only ones that are still in position, the virtually there's only half the egg there. But he measured these with such precision that he was able then to extrapolate what the geometry was. And the geometry turned out, next one over there. Sorry, first shot. This is looking over, this is a sunset. Um, I beg your pardon, I think it's a sunrise looking over this. This stone here is the one you can see and that the fork of the hills behind. At a particular, th this I think is pretty high summer. It's not like completely the summer solstice, but that's looking from in here across that stone. And that shows you how small and insignificant the stones are. It's, it's really remarkable that Alexander Tom took so much time on this circle. But the fruit it bore, to me, are uh, incredibly important. Next one over here. <coughs> the way in which the circle is constructed, these, these are the two um, Pythagorean triangles. And from using these Pythagorean triangles, he constructed a smaller circle above and a larger circle below. And the stones, I haven't shaded the dark ones in, but the stones which are still standing are on this side. But that is construction. And I discovered that if you put an equilateral triangle inside the top circle and another large equilateral triangle inside the bottom circle turned the other way, of course this, this triangle is standing on the base of this one, that both those circles are divided rather extraordinarily. <clears throat> I should say they're divided because the first triangle extends to here and the symmetrical one to here. That is two-ninths of this circle. And that turns out that the circle is an incredibly sophisticated a piece of geometry, <coughs> quite unlike the African ones we saw this morning, which were the stones were well-shaped, the stones we use in this country on the whole were not shaped very much until we got to Stonehenge. They were stones which had obviously very special qualities, but it, the stones were established on geometric places, and that's to me the key to it. So the next one there shows a further analysis. What I've done is I've drawn the three triangles inside the top circle, the three triangles which make up the nine-pointed star. And no doubt there are people here in the room who have come across the teaching of a man called Gurdjieff. And Gurdjieff taught on the nine-pointed star. His whole cosmology was taught on it. And it may well be that he was revivifying a very, very ancient doctrine. He found this material, apparently, in Central Asia. And it may well have been when it migrated to but nevertheless, what's rather beautiful about the way in which this top circle relates to the bottom circle, if you take these two positions, the two ninths up here, travel through the bottom two ninths, which are down here, and keep going, you coincide. So the larger triangle is proportional to the smaller triangle um, on this taper here. It's, I mean, again, this is much too much to give you in one go and talk like this, but um, it's a very good way of having a commercial for my book. Next month you can buy this and study it closely. Next one here. So we come to this rather remarkable phenomenon of taking a 12 interval chord, dividing it into 12 equal spaces and tying knots if you like, and then, which is what I've drawn here, and using that as the basis of getting a right angle. 
<coughs> what's fascinating about this, this has very much more to it than merely getting a right angle here. You get a very nice 60 degree here and a very nice 30 degree up there, but here you get a 90 degree. This is still used by builders when they're first laying out first right angle for a plan of a building, even right now today. But what's interesting is that threefold symmetry, fourfold symmetry, and fivefold symmetry are the only symmetries we have in three dimensions, and they're represented by the platonic figures. Five platonic figures all answer to threefold, fourfold, or fivefold. Of course, they answer to twofold as well, but those are the key differences between the symmetries. So, that, again, much more to this. In the same way, if you take another chord and make 13 intervals, which is a rather beautiful lunar relationship to the 12, these 12 intervals being solar, take a 13 one and you make a triangle out of that, that triangle will give you a seven degree, a, a, a division of seven on a circle. Seven being lunar, the 13 being lunar. So it's all it's really extraordinary. And that's one of the reasons why I've enjoyed Robin Heath's work so much. He's had the audacity to actually look at certain mathematical um, facts which have, seem to have no more bearing than pure mathematics and actually making cosmic sense out of them. It's, it's, it's way ahead of anything any empirical scientist could possibly digest, I think, at the moment. But it'll be interesting to see what happens as time goes on. Next one over there. <coughs> Here's the 345 triangle being used beautifully at Druid Temple. I must say, every time I look at this drawing, I think of the times I've bitten on an awful piece of wax for my dentist so he can tell where my teeth are. But <coughs> you've all had that uncomfortable feeling you're not going to survive. Anyway, here is the basic triangle placed. These are the megalithic yards involved. And what's interesting here is the extension from this basic 3, 4, 5 triangle out to here is 7 megalithic yards before we get to the curvature. The curvature here is struck from over here. The curvature here is struck from over here. The curvature at the top struck from there, and the curvature at the bottom struck from here. But we move out seven here, and it means that by the time we go from here up to the top, it is nine megalithic yards. There's nine megalithic yards and seven me megalithic yards. So once again, these two important numbers seem to be embodied necessarily in that stone circle. Next one here. This is, the, as I said before, I think one of the most important stone circles in Britain. It's just my own feelings, having been there a couple of times. It's an extraordinary experience. And the last experience we went up there, we had to, we had to bear through a snowstorm. And that was really quite, quite out of this world, because the snowstorm, the snow was coming at us almost horizontally. And as we stood there, we, when we saw the storm coming, we couldn't make up our minds to run for it, the civilization below or to stay where we were. We decided we wouldn't run for it. We stood where we were. And, and each of us were, were divided in half by white snow. It was absolutely weird. The most spooky experience I've been through. <laughs> and the snow drove against all the stones and halved them, and all the, while we stood still, our bodies were halved by snow on one side and nothing on the other. Quite extraordinary. Anyway, I don't necessarily recommend you go out and have that therapy, but if you wish. Anyway, let's have a look at Mole. Well, stone. There's the geometry of Moe, as Alexander Tom distilled it. I showed previously a five-pointed star between these five points. And what it amounted to was that from here, that much, turning the corner from that point. From that point in the five-sided point, just turning the corner. From this point, turning the corner. Then from the middle, doing that. This is the only different side. It's got one full side. And here, turning the corner again across here, from here, turning that corner. So the question was, what about this flattened area? There's a flattened area in between each of those. Now, the flattened area came from that point there, the center of this little arc. That gave us the flattening here. And again, the remarkable thing about that is, I'd, I'm not sure if it's on my next slide, I hope it is. That happens to be exactly the point of it totally symmetrical seven-pointed star. So the basis of this whole circle is five, and then suddenly we get, and here's the whole, it doesn't go right up to the top, but here you see the seven, and again, even more astounding to me was between the little bit of corner which the five did, the opening of the seven-pointed star, there are seven stones 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. In each case, this case, of course, this, this is straddling, but there are seven stones in each of the openings of the seven-pointed star. So um, I agree with Alexander Tom, this is one of the most sophisticated pieces of geometry we've got of these kind of stone circles. I know there's a huge emphasis on Stonehenge because it's grandeur and so forth. This is still quite a modest circle, but um, absolutely extraordinary how little we know about people who could um, take... Um, Look at the difference in size and shape of these stones to take these stones this has which been are available to place them on production. these geometries. For more and information, for visit megalithomania.co.uk. So I'm going to move one stage further into the third dimension, and nobody must have any doubts that the third dimension was as normal to megalithic communities as it is for any of us. When you go to the grocers and you decide to buy some fruit, you don't think twice that your apples and plums and everything else are more or less spherical. And not totally so. Some fruit is very spherical, others a little less so. So I'm just taking an example here, another example here, next one here. And that is that Neolithic human being would be just as perceptive as any inquisitive uh, person nowadays. And you look very closely at a leaf in which a butterfly has left its eggs, you will see these eggs are almost perfectly spherical. As I have to say, and we'll come on to that in a minute, the human egg, your first experience. Everybody in this room, I can confidently tell you that your first experience, the definition of life is that which can experience, your first experience was to be a sphere. That it may not be very remarkable to you, but it's totally astounding to me. <laughs> And, of course, sometimes when flowers complete themselves, I came to the conclusion when I was putting these slides together, one gets strange little messages, and I thought to myself, there's a model of the soul. And so as far as I'm concerned, it's the fulfillment of that particular kind of daisy family flower, but it is an extraordinary uh, mathematical and simple, simple but mathematical diagram of the unfolding of that flower, and therefore I believe the unfolding of the soul probably I think flowers speak to us at that level. Next one here. Sorry, the slide's not very bright, but again, um, when I was in Africa, and I was teaching geometry in Africa with Buckminster Fuller, I was very aware of the fact that the little girls who sat beside the road, they'd put a single brick down, and they'd sit on that single brick all day, because um, they knew how to sit on the bones of their bottom rather than on the flesh. Um, the oranges they piled up which they're going to sell were either in octahedral or tetrahedral pattern. So the putting together of fruit, even to sell it, you, you, next time you notice somebody's piling fruit up, you'll see platonic figures in there if you wish to find them. Next one over there. So we've touched on this before. This particular group of seven stones shows how triangular what we call triangular close packing, and we use that word triangular close packing for um, the atomic world as much as we do for maybe packing fruit together, and hexagons are intimately related. The triangle is a symbol of consciousness traditionally, and the hexagon is a symbol of the world, the noose, the world of, of, of the intelligible, the world higher than human mind. Triangle, human mind, square, earthly plane. That's usually how the symbolism goes. This has been a Megalithomania yeah. audio square, production. Pebbles. Next one For over more there. information, visit megalithomania.co.uk. We talk about squaring numbers. How many people actually stop to think that it literally means squaring? That's the square of two. Square of two is four. Square of three is nine. Square of four is sixteen. So, um, that's where we get the word squaring in mathematics from, and is the way in which the Greeks did it. The way the great mathematicians, as I said before, Euclid and Plato and Aristotle, how they did their mathematics. Next one here. And this may or may not be a surprise to you, it doesn't matter if it is or not, but as I said to you before, your first experience, giving the definition that, that is currently fashionable in the bio, botanical and biological world, is that to be alive is to experience. It, to, the test of life is that that piece of life can experience. 
And because it can experience, it can therefore adapt the environment to become itself. That's what we call eating. <clears throat> this is your first experience. And therefore, your first experience is not only to be a sphere, to be a point. What is the normal definition of a point? What is the definition of a line? The definition of a line is something which has a point at each end. So the minimum possible line is your second experience. Your single egg splits and you become two. Now, next, they both split and you become four. They both split and you become from a square to a cube and then again to an icosahedron, the most sophisticated platonic figure. And very rarely mentioned to be an icosahedron from the book I got it from, a science book. Then you reach a point where you can't have more spheres than 60 in a sphere. Those are the 60 possibilities in the Chinese book of changes, the I Ching. When the final four of the 64 come in, then invagination takes place. This can't bear 64. It can bear 60, it can't bear 64. It starts turning inside out, and we have the beginnings of all our bodily systems. Ectomorph, mesomorph, and entomorph. The three bodily tissues which build up into making. But what you're looking at here is actually not the way the human being develops. That's the way all other animals develop. But we develop differently, which is quite fascinating. We do not become a square on four. Next one over there. <coughs> this is the human um, splitting. And from whole single to the dual, more egg forms, to three to four. Now these four are in a tetrahedral arrangement. The tetrahedral arrangement is you have three at the bottom and one on top. And it is the first platonic figure. It is the figure of fire, it's a symbol of spirit, and this is how we go. The, the frogs and every other animal goes through a process of being square and a cube. So if somebody calls you a square, you know what they're really calling you. They're calling you a frog. Somewhere. Next one there. There is a um, photographic image of all of us, everybody in this room, your fourth experience in terms of differentiation in this life you're in now is to actually be a tetrahedron. They are the four spheres. There's, there's two here above and two below. So when Plato taught the doctrine of anamnesis, which is to remember, he's pointing out, as he did through the whole of his Timaeus, that we are actually structured on mathematical principles. And here they are, geometric principles. It is as normal for us as it is for many other things right through the universe. When we get down to atomic level, which we have recently um, verified, everything, every single thing, materiality, is structured on geometric principles. <coughs> so it is, it is the language of unity. It's the language to travel to find unity. Not the language to travel to find differentiation. That doesn't help you at all. It is the language which, as Socrates said, it rekindles that third organ, which is, um, he doesn't use the word eye, he calls it an organ, but he said it's worth 10,000 of your fleshly eyes. And you rekindle that eye, which is the only organ you've got in your body which tells you the absolute truth, by doing arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. That is the doctrine of um, the Republic. And that's a very rare thing for, for Socrates to be so dogmatic and to say, these things will give you that. Usually, Socrates questioned, 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 and drew the truth out of people, because that was his <clears throat> primary teaching. We have everything in us. Nobody can teach us anything, but somebody can help get those things out of us. Next one over there. So, to me, it a, was a stunning, stunning, and, and, and uh, quite overwhelming and moving to go up to Edinburgh and discover that the vast majority of these balls, which were made in the Neolithic period, over 3000 BC, were tetrahedral in form. And I put a whole collection there to show how frequently they're done, and also the variations in them. It is extremely difficult. Next time you get a ball in your hand, which has got no differentiation in it at all, try and find four positions on that ball, which are equidistant from each other. You'll find out how difficult it is. But there is... Neolithic man making these things, nobody has a clue. No, the archaeologists have ignored my book for 30 years because no archaeologists have come up with a theory. A, they weren't allowed. They weren't allowed to know about mathematics because they hadn't got language yet. They were only grunting and throwing things at each other. In fact, when I went to Edinburgh, I asked the man there, what, the, what do they use these things for? 
the custodian, he said, oh, for throwing at each other. <laughs> I thought, what an expensive hobby. It'd take, take two years making these other str strongest stone you've got in Scotland just to throw at somebody. Anyway, um, my, my conclusions now, uh, something I can uh, sort of maybe confess here amongst you lot, is that they are actually soul containers. Now, it may seem rather strange to you. I don't know whether you thought this way before, but the North American Indians, when an Indian boy child, and, and I think girl children too, but I think the slight difference between the two about what... It was the job of a young English, sorry, young Indian child to find a pebble, a pebble that would talk to him. And when he found the pebble which would talk to him, he would then put it in a little bag and wear it around his neck for the rest of his life. And there's some very nice, very few, but very nice recordings of people having found their pebble. And one um, North American Indian recorded the fact that the pebble told him that if he kept this pebble, it would help him cure people of their illnesses for the rest of his life. All the spiritual forces would come to help him. So we don't know anything about megalithic community. And as far as I'm concerned, they're much more likely to have been nearer to where the North American Indians were when we first went over there and slaughtered them than, than almost anything else. There are communities, I'm sure, on the planet still which have this knowledge, but they don't anymore share the knowledge with people called anthropologists. Next one here. So this is just to show you, if you take, you can get a polystyrene ball, and if you take two points on a central line, just before they turn around the corner here, and then, <coughs> next one here, and looking at the bottom, this is, these are the lines of the tetrahedron, there'll be one triangle here, one triangle here, one triangle here, one at the bottom. You then join up the center points of those tetrahedral lines, you get the face of an octahedron. There'll be eight of these triangles on that figure. Now, I believe this is not a difficult thing for a megalithic man, woman, child to have done. And in fact, curious enough, in a shop in the high street just now, I saw a, a pot which had some skin stretched over it. I went into the shop, North American Indian artifact, and asked the lady where it came from. She said, oh, I think it came from sort of Arizona which meant she didn't know, and, and my daughter luckily knew it was a finger pot, so she explained it was a finger pot. But it had the, the gut of a, <coughs> excuse me, an animal stretched over it um, for no apparent purpose. It wasn't for holding it up, and I think that's probably the way in which uh, they would take, they may be made, there are some quite complete spheres that would use uh, animal gut to take the job. Now I just use sticky tapes and and um, polystyrene balls is a bit cheaper. Next one here. So here we go. These extraordinarily beautiful things are in the museum in Edinburgh. Um, and some are just exquisitely highly polished. These are both octahedron and cube at the same time. That's the most extraordinary thing about these figures. You can't actually say, is it an octahedron? Because there are the same number of points as an octahedron. That would be a triangular face. Or is it a cube? You can actually look at it both ways. And, and I, I put these tapes on here to show that would be the face of a cube. It, the bump would be the point of an octahedron, but the tape I put on would be the face of a cube. Because they, they, what I suggested in my book on order in space is that the triangular solids are the feminine, and the, for instance, the octahedron would be the female of a family of fourfold symmetry, and the cube would be the male. That seemed to make sense to me. Anyway, there's just four examples of the symmetry coming from that figure. Next one over there. There is the octahedron again. That's the face of the octahedron, which would be a triangle between three of these bumps. And then what I've done is, from the center of those faces, I've stretched silver tape around, and that will give me a cube. As I turn this sphere around, you'll see it turning into a cube, which is easier to see. Next one here. That's the same model that you're looking at there, but it's easier to see the cube there and to see a cross going across the face of the cube. So those stone, can I call them soul holders that they, we see there, um, soul vehicles, they were both the cube, which for um, Plato was the molecule of earth or the solid state and the octahedron, which is the molecule of air, or breath, or the gaseous state. 
So very, very interesting. Between corporeality and breath, which are part of the description of basis of life, they're both together in the same solid. Next one over there. Um, sorry for the commercial, but it's served me right because the commercial is cut in half, but the first book that I did was actually about all the possibilities of the platonic figures. It's called Order in Space, and in fact, there are some copies downstairs, and I'm going to have my arm twisted behind my back. If anybody wants to buy one, I'll actually sign it for them. So you have to have commercials these days, don't you? Anyway, so the point about that book is that that was not in any way. It was because I had written that book, because I'd studied with Buckminster Fuller, that I, was, I saw these first... Uh, stone figures, and I realized the people who made them must have known everything that was known um, by Plato. And that is two or two and a half thousand years before Plato. And that means the history of mathematics is way off. But that's something else. Next one here. So here we have the icosahedron. There's another stone sphere we found in Edinburgh, and I stretched tapes from the points of the icosahedron so you could see the triangular, and that is the molecule of water which is the vehicle of life, according to Plato. And that's the mother of fivefold symmetry. Next one over there. And that's the dodecahedron, which is the father, one might say, if one wants to use this analogy, the male of fivefold symmetry. So these are 12, 12 panels of fiveness. Now what is really quite stunning in many ways is that Socrates, when he was told that he had to, he had to die that afternoon, and he had to take this poison voluntarily, and that's a pretty, pretty tough assignment. And it shows a person of the deepest possible spiritual knowledge and conviction that he could do so, and tell everybody else in the room who were crying and moaning not to do so. He said, it's all right, it's fine for me, I know where I'm going, sort of thing. Anyway, before he did actually take the poison, he actually said, I'm going to tell you what the universe looks like for somebody like myself. And of course, he was probably an avatar, who was a very elevated being. And he said... The universe, next one here, looks like those balls that the children kick about and play with, with 12 panels on. And the people who first, they didn't, we weren't able to translate this until the 1920s. Right through the Victorian period, the footballs were then made out of orange-shaped lozenges. They didn't know what he was talking about. Suddenly, we suddenly realized that what he was talking about was the dodecahedron. That is the same figure as that. That is a football. You can go and buy that at a sports shop even today, a little miniature one like this. And he said, it is so beautiful. That if you could see the world as I could see it from above, it's so beautiful. Each one of those 12 panels is a different color. And they're colors like nothing you have ever experienced on Earth with your fleshly eyes. And it's an amazing vision. It's really worth reading the last, the last um, speech of Socrates. And it's all about this figure. And that was a model of the universe. Now, I don't see any reason why that shouldn't have been the universe, for, and, and knowledgeably so, for Neolithic man. Who, who are we to say that he didn't have that understanding? Next one here. And the next one there. What Rudolf Steiner, next one over here too. What Rudolf Steiner did was to show you can take the dodecahedron and by splitting it in a certain way, and following round, rather like you do a, a tennis ball seam, you can actually unfold the whole of the zodiac in the correct sequence. This can be folded up and put into a sphere. And what we do at Kairos, my daughter Amanda is sitting in the audience here, and she's selling some of our Kairos literature. So for many years now, we've been trying to promote people to get into understanding how to make these things. And what we can thank Rudolf Steiner for was to show that the traveling through the 12 signs of the zodiac was a perfectly logical thing that can come out of this dodecahedron um, if, it's, if it's actually cut up that way. Now, we, 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 we make these worksheet sheets so that, big enough so that people can actually cut them, make them, and stick them together. And it's the quickest way to get into some sort of experience of what these solids are. And personally, I believe it's how you get to know who you really are. Not who you think you are, who you were named as being, or what you think you're feeding every day you have a meal. But one of the most intrinsic things within your being, which is actually the nature of your soul, I believe that's what these things are about. Next one over there, please. Anyway, what we did when we went up to Edinburgh, we found the full contingent of all the platonic figures, and I put them there, and I put them next to some rather grotty, I have to say, modern plastic um, dice which came out, 
Here we have what I call the Brancusi cube, because it's so beautifully made, and octahedron, um, icosahedron here, and dodecahedron there, and so forth. I arranged these in a group to show that they were aware of the, the whole set of five. I've got a little bit more than the five in here, because there's two versions of the cube. Um, the five platonic figures were well known to megalithic man, at least 2,500, if not 3,000 years before Plato wrote about it. Next one here. So just finally, to give you something which is it's not difficult to do, to model these things on a sphere, if you wish. Um, <coughs> you can see the face of the cube in this diamond-shaped one. And then there's two equilateral triangles overlapping the cube a little bit this way and coming in a little bit this way. This overlap comes in from this, these two sides. These two overlaps go into there and there. Then what you do is you put this line here, you put in a, another line, which is the golden mean smaller, between the center of that triangle and the center of this triangle. And from there, this, this, this is the cube and the icosahedron, next one there. And by continuing that gold line, that gold tape, that gold tape will make you a dodecahedron. And it shows, you can see, and that's what my book Order in Space is about, the five platonic solids, which are both different, are also utterly the same when they're put onto a sphere. This is the great mystery and the extraordinary thing. Spherical unity, the paradox is a cube is different from an icosahedron, a cube is different from an octahedron, but if they're on a sphere, they all marry perfectly. Okay, I think that's probably it. This is the book, which is going to be published again next, um, next month. I think it'll be available in the shops next month. And there's quite a bit of new material in it. Um, and I hope that those who haven't got a copy of it might find it useful. Most of the material I've talked about this afternoon are in that book. It's been published by Floris Book. Next one over there. And that is it, folks. Thank you very much. Would you like to take some questions? One, yes. two, two questions? <laughs> would, would anyone like to ask a question at all? Yes, over here. Hang on. Wait, 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 wait. Hi, can you tell me where the stone circle was? The, um, was it in Cumbria? Sorry, say that again? The stone circle. Yes. Yeah, the, where you had the snow experience. Where, where, where is Malti Uchuf? Malti Uchuf is in North Wales. And I think probably um, not, being a, oop, not being a computer user myself and not having a mobile phone, I'm utterly in another century. But if you Google, and I do know that word, you'll probably find Malti Uchuf. It means the, I think it means the house on the highest hill in Welsh, Malti Uchuf. And it's in North Wales. It, it is able to be, there's actually a youth hostel down the hill from it, which is rather good. But it's quite a walk up the hill to get to. And if you want to go in the winter, yes? Oh, thank you. Berwyn Mountains. Here's an authority here. Um, any, any, another question? Sig. If the, uh, if the purpose of sacred geometry is to take us back to the one, yes. um, and most sacred geometry uh, that I've worked with over the years is in two dimensions, although you've been talking about three dimensions here today, and there are now, I think, 11 dimensions some people are talking about, uh, isn't even going into the third dimension going in the wrong direction? Um, I don't think so, because the third dimension is the third dimension, and if you really want to get into that, um, the third dimension is the furthest that the spirit actually expresses itself. That's the final dimension. Two dimensions is one step closer back to the origin. So definitely two dimensions in one sense is superior to three dimensions. But one dimension is superior to two dimensions. And that comes back to the line. That is the line of scripture, the line of the beads which people pray with, the knotted ropes and so forth. To actually understand the line, the significant line, then even higher than that is the point, which is the origin of the line. So both directions will take you to unity. The point 
I came to the conclusion when I was struggling with it, because I wasn't a mathematician, I came to the conclusion that a point is also a sphere, which again is a paradox, which is not acceptable in normal mathematics. But studying the two dimensions is absolutely valid. And when you get to the root dimensions in two dimensions, then you, the, you're being given the hints as to which three-dimensional figures that those root dimensions came from, square root of two, square root of three, square root of five, plus one over two. So fine. Any root that leads you to unity, my dear man, I honor. Okay, one last question over here. Keith, when Time Stands Still first came out, and I came across it in Watkins' bookshop, I opened it, and when I saw the photos of those amazing stones, uh, of the platonic solids, I realized in about less than a millisecond that you'd made one of the greatest discoveries in the history of science. <laughs> so congratulations. <laughs> But what I want to know, um, I don't know, I think I might have asked you this before, but um, is there anybody else who's ever recognized that, who is either a historian of science or an archaeologist? Anybody? Well, who, let's, who, as far as I know, just to answer that first thing, um, now they can't ignore the fact of what they're looking at, but they have chosen to ignore the fact of what they're looking at. It, it threatened, it's so deeply threatening to the whole of the Darwinian idea that bodily evolution comes before consciousness evolution, which is patently, I have to say, and traditionally absurd. None of us make any movement of any kind ourselves unless there's a prior neural action. Then the body will act. But if that isn't the perfect lesson that... Consciousness comes before body. Consciousness comes before action. I don't know what is. But we have been, in the most extraordinary way, hoodwinked by the people who have taken up Darwin's idea that, that bodily evolution comes first. I, I much prefer to read the end of the Timaeus when Plato, rather playfully, talks about birds being the evolution of light-headed people who couldn't stay on the ground, and serpents were ev the evolution of people who were grabbing around on the ground all the time. And in a way, there's humor in it, but it's just as a likely evolution as the other. But uh, quite honestly, um, we live in a very, very strange time, and I've often said it, and I'll say it time and again, we are, the whole of humanity at the moment, that is quite apart from the people in this audience, are in a state of semi-insanity. We have really lost our way, desperately, and that's why I turn around and say, oh gosh, we're consuming the planet. Well, we're consuming our own mother. Once you stop using the word mother earth, God help us. And people talking about exploiting this and exploiting that. Well, do we exploit our mother? If we do, God help our mother. Anyway, I mean, our literal mother. I, I, I just think we've got a big change to make, and that change is definitely underway now. And I think the indications that people like Pythagoras made, that number is supreme, and how numbers expressed in space becomes geometry, how numbers expressed in time becomes music, and how numbers expressed in space and time becomes astronomy, then we, we get nearer to the, the core of the matter. They are very simple things in one way, but they're very profound, and they are the nature of the soul. The whole of Plato's Timaeus is the unfolding of the soul in proportional relationships. Um, so whether anybody believes it or not is something else. But I found it astounding, this book's been out for so long, and not one archaeologist has even deigned to review my book, let alone condemn it. It's a great compliment, actually, if you're ignored rather than condemned sometimes. <laughs> but I'm putting the book out again next month, and it'll be interesting to see if any, any of the archaeologists will face up to the fact that, that our whole history of human consciousness and Darwinianism really doesn't stand up. It really doesn't stand up. Enough said. Great. Keith, thank you very, very much. This has been a Megalithomania audio production. For more information, visit megalithomania.co.uk.